this um, particular um, movie taken by an adventure astronomer. It's, it's a great aurora as seen in, in, from Australia. So aurora borealis, aurora australis. When you see these spectacular light shows, what that tells us is that there is actually a storm going on in our own environment, in our own geospace. But the cause of this storm is actually a remote storm on the sun that makes this uh, happen. I don't know if any of you have seen auroras, but they are a sight to be hoped. So you have already been told that we are going to talk about space weather. And um, you know, as Oscar Wilde said, conversation about the weather the terrestrial weather in this case is the last refuge of the unimaginative, right? And so now we are going to introduce something perhaps a little bit more interesting. So don't knock the weather because most of us really use that to start a conversation. <laughs> well, today when you go away from here, you can have another one to add to that space weather, which many people don't know. Trust me, you could, you could go long ways with space weather now for a while. And then finally, of course, we have space weather kind of as a definition, and I don't want to read that. It's, it's kind of boring, jargonic, and I will be describing what space weather is. Even though the word weather is in space weather, and we borrow all the analogies from terrestrial weather to describe space weather, let me tell you, it is completely different from terrestrial weather. And what makes it completely different is magnetism, magnetic field. That's right. It's really a miniature And I wanted to show this. You know, this, this is like a outer limits. I think there might be uh, people here who have actually seen those episodes in the past. Uh, it is kind of cartoonish, but the point is so true. If the sun, sun is an ordinary um, star. I know you are astronomers. It's an ordinary magnetic variable star. But if I took the word magnetic away from this variability, we would not, we probably would not have had life here. We would not have space weather. So it is this magnetic variability on the sun that makes life possible, and I think that makes many things around us possible and makes the sun a very unique and interesting star. And so what I would like to do here is really go very generally, I know that there are people who are experts probably here in everything about star, maybe even space weather, but then there are many probably uh, who wouldn't mind going through just a basic description of what a star is, what the sun is, what stars are like, uh, you know, what the sun does basically, um, at least the B-type stars. And so this is just sun structure, I, you know, driven by thermonuclear fusion in the core uh, where neutrons and protons collide under intense uh, pressure, gravity, and temperature, produce helium, so hydrogen is converted to helium, and then there is generation of um, energy, just um, Einstein's principle of E equal to mc squared. And this happens uh, at a rate of about um, every second 700 million tons of hydrogen to helium. So it's a staggering amount of energy that's produced and it takes a long time for this energy to then come through the core to the surface of the sun, which is the photosphere, uh, which is the pale yellow ball that we are used to seeing. The photosphere has a temperature of about 5,000 degrees Celsius. It is not that hot, not compared to the core. But if you go slightly above the photosphere, what we call the outer atmosphere of the sun, also known as the corona, the temperature rises to about a million to two million degrees Kelvin. And this kind of defies basic laws of 
from a dynamic. So, you know, if you're standing in front of a stove top, uh, stove, you know, burning, and you stand there, the temperature is hot, and as you move away from it, the temperature would go down. Heat falls up. That's what we are used to. And in this case, we are going away from the source of the heat, which was the cold. And so the temperature should continuously fall. All of a sudden, we see this peak in temperature of million to two million degrees Celsius. And, and this, this, is, this is actually one of, uh, of the fundamental mysteries that we have known about for all, more than 50 years, but we have not answered it yet. In fact, in my program, we have a mission today called Solar Pro Plus, that this is a mission that will actually go to the sun. And I kid you, not into the sun, but into the corona, where the temperature is this hot. It is going to go to within 9.5 solar radii. The mission is called Solar Pro Plus. It's going to launch in 2018. And the goal of this mission is to actually measure the temperature, the particles, the magnetic field in that environment to you know, provide ground truth for what makes the corona so hot. Solar wind, as I said, you know, we, we, are, we are borrowing words from terrestrial weather, and so we call solar wind. But this solar wind, it can be you know, calm or gusty, again, borrowing in energies, but it is nothing like uh, the terrestrial wind that we experience, you know, experience uh, whether an ordinary day or during a hurricane. Solar wind is actually a stream of particles, electrons and protons. Your atoms are stripped away of its electrons. So what you have is an ionized environment. It's called the fourth state of matter. It is plasma. And that's what we deal with. And that's what makes it so different from anything else that we deal with in our terrestrial environment, where everything is neutral. There is no charge unless you plug something into the socket where you get your electricity. What we deal with in terms of physics and understanding is a charged environment. Everything is charged. And it's, it's, it's electromagnetic environment. Sunspot. So again, I'm going to take you through the, some of these basic elements of what goes into making space weather, solar storms. Um, dark areas on the sun, sunspots, there are sometimes naked eye sunspots. You astronomers, I'm sure, go out, not at night then, but during the day, you know, I'm, I hope wearing protective uh, glasses to actually look at the sun, to see these naked eye. These sunspots can be very, very large, and sometimes you can see them as dark spots. Um, not all of them are always that large. So why are sunspots dark? It is simply because the magnetic field in the sunspot is so strong that it inhibits the transfer of energy from the layer beneath. But uh, believe me, these dark regions are actually really not dark. So if you were able to take a sunspot away from the photosphere, put it somewhere else. I mean, it could have the brightness of a full moon, for example. So these are in reality not dark, but in contrast to the photosphere, they appear as uh, dark regions and a little bit cooler. And these sunspots come with a frequency of about 11 years, and that's why you hear the word 11-year solar cycle. And then so here what you see, this bottom uh, panel right there, just plotted, and I can't even read, okay, so it's somewhere from 1610, to 2010, you, know, you can see those 11 year fluctuations. What you're looking there are essentially counts of sunspots. Now, sunspot numbers are not a physical parameter, but it's an indication still of what the sun is doing. That its magnetic activity is going through a peak and then it's going down. And for the longest time, uh, I, I think scientists have uh, speculated that everything that happens on the sun, you know, in terms of storms, really uh, happens during solar maximum. Well, we are finding out that's not entirely true. What happens during the peak of a solar cycle 
is the frequency of solar storms rises, but that says nothing about its intensity, its uh, duration, any of that. You can have solar storms anytime, but the frequency is higher during the peak. A little bit about how we actually uh, really get our observations, because it's, it's ultimately the observations that we get from telescopes, remote sensing telescopes, ground-based telescopes, that allow us to infer what the sun is doing, to study the sun as a star. And, and so that little ball right there is essentially the visible spectrum of the sun. That's the sun we can see, okay? our um, unaided eyes. But what we measure, why NASA is involved in observing the sun, is most of our observations come from space. And it's because we observe the sun in ultraviolet, in extreme ultraviolet. These wavelengths are absorbed in our atmosphere. And therefore, we cannot use ground-based uh, telescopes to observe the sun in these um, wavelengths. And so this, is, uh, this will give you kind of the different images that you get as you begin to observe the sun uh, in different wavelengths. And what it's doing is giving you different layers. So the corona is actually emitting soft X-rays, extreme ultraviolet rays. And, and so what you see in the corona is a, a very turbulent sun, which is a very structured sun, which you are not able to see really when you're looking at just the photosphere with your unaided eyes. And so we come up with different filters, just like you use filters for your telescopes. These filters are they put in front of telescope to get uh, essentially observation at different wavelengths. This is, this is another kind of cool thing, helioseismology. Much like seismology on Earth, you know, the entire, it's the same kind of technique, the way we detect earthquake through seismology. So helioseismology is quakes on the sun. The entire sun vibrates really from a very complex pattern of acoustic waves. And let me see if I can actually play this. This is the five minutes oscillation. So you are actually hearing the sound of this vibration, one particular move of it. And you, you can actually, these, these sound waves, you know, they are traveling. When these sound waves um, take you to the next one, these sound waves, um, when they go through embedded magnetic field, they actually, there is a delay of the sound waves. It's about 12 second total travel time of six hours. And, and a trick, a really neat idea that scientists came up with, is that we can use our probing device, these filters, to measure sound waves. This way, you are able to actually image the far side of the sun, because if there are magnetic fields emerging on the far side of the sun, which our telescopes can't see, but the sound waves will be delayed in their propagation. And you can import those data and you can begin to get, you know, faint images of active regions uh, appearing on the far side of the sun. It takes about 27 days for sun to make one complete rotation on its axis. So if you know something is coming up on the far side, it becomes really important for us to know that from forecasting point of view of space weather. And so this, this technique was developed about uh, 20, 25 years ago and uh, with SOHO, and now with Solar Dynamics Observatory. Of course, Mission of Living with the Star, we are perfecting this art. I have, um, let's see. And so Solar Dynamics Observatory is kind of the latest in a fleet of um, missions that Living with the Star program has been launching. And what you are going to watch here are three years of solar dynamics observatory observations. These observations are actually IMAX quality, better than high definition TV. 
uh, it is um, you know this this laptop or the projection device they do not have the resolution of the SDO images, but it is just spectacular what you see here. And I'm not going to play the entire movie, but take a look at this. This, this we just put this out um, on our website about a week ago. And this was captured by National Public Radio and put, you know, this was in the midst of the uh, bombing in Boston, and this was used to kind of provide some kind of solace to people that there are, there's also good news, um, even though the sun is producing storms. What, what you're seeing there again is um, soft X-ray image, it's 171 uh, angstrom image of the sun. The dark regions are regions called coronal folds. That's where really these are regions of open magnetic field. And so particles can actually escape, and these are electrons and protons escaping. The bright regions are active regions. That's where magnetic field is really strong. This magnetic field can get sheared, twisted, and eventually erupt in the form of a solar storm. It can be a solar flare with a coronal mass ejection, but a lot of material is then blown out, which will have consequences on our geospace um, environment. You can see that these active regions are kind of separated between north and south. Typically, that's how solar cycle happens. Um, you have these active regions following <coughs> the belt along the northern and southern uh, hemisphere. This is kind of a cartoon movie, but I thought it would be good to show this movie to tell you what is space weather and uh, you know, what does it do to our geospace environment. Maybe not. Okay, later. I guess the, this movie is not working. If you have seen the movie that I was going to show, that would have actually showed you how an active region produces a coronal mass ejection, which just pushes out material in the form of electrons and protons uh, into interplanetary medium. The distance between the sun and Earth is 93 million miles. It is, it's, a, uh, it's a huge distance. And in that space, these particles are pushed out where shock waves are, you know, Slow speed wind, run, high speed wind runs into slow speed wind, produces shock, which energizes particles, and then all of this material comes and impinges on Earth's magnetosphere. So what you're seeing there, that tiny, um, tiny ball here is Earth, and all of this is Earth's magnetosphere, and and the billowing of the cocoon is essentially. Uh, from the pressure that is produced by the uh, solar wind on, on the magnetosphere. Earth, much like the sun, also has its own uh, innate magnetic field and a magnetosphere. And, and ultimately, it is this, this interaction with the sun's magnetic field and Earth's magnetic field getting reconnected, which then transfers energy that produces a lot of impact in our geospace um, environment. Now, space weather is not a new concept. You know, space weather, uh, I guess, the, was first felt um, way back um, in, in the 18th century during the, um, when, uh, during the 1859 uh, Carrington event, the telegraph wires were set on flame. And I'll talk more about the Carrington event that is our example of um, superstorm. And then we, this um, magnetic field, this interaction of electromagnetic field can induce current in the ground, which, which can damage all kinds of um, equipment. This is just a unique view of, of Aurora. I showed you the aurora australis taken from ground-based observation. This is what um, astronauts in um, International Space Station 
actually hit the watermarks. We have very unique global perspective of this horrory. And typically, this is actually along, uh, happens along Earth's magnetic axis, which is tilted towards geographic axis. And it's an oval shape. And in this oval, the magnetic field lines are open. And, and that's the area through which particles can penetrate. So space weather, why should we care? I, I think um, Alex kind of gave you already quite a few descriptions of why today we care about space weather. Space weather is not new. Sun has done what it is doing for as long as we know, but even way before that. So why is it that we as a society have become so interested in space weather? And it, it's simply because our society has become very reliant on technology. Any technology that, uh, that, that can be harmed by electromagnetic radiation is actually vulnerable to space weather. And uh, that, that's kind of in a nutshell why we are interested in space weather. And then it becomes kind of start looking at some of the bigger items. Uh, we have um, communication. Uh, broadcast, TV, radio, cell phones, pagers, um, all of these are affected by, uh, by space weather. Most importantly, space weather can affect satellites in space. And many of the things that we depend on today uh, come from satellites. If one of the satellites go down, those services will go away. Uh, we have human in space. We have uh, long duration uh, human mission. We are thinking of leaving low Earth orbit for extended interplanetary mission, going to moon, Mars, asteroid, wherever society will take us. And we are no longer shielded by Earth's magnetosphere. Earth's magnetosphere actually shields us from the harmful radiation of the sun. If you think about the moon, it's barren. There is nothing. If you think about Mars, why is Mars what it is today? Mars doesn't have a very strong magnetosphere, and therefore it is not protected the way we are. Um, and this is, this is, you know, the damages that can be caused by space weather can actually run into trillions. Just quickly go over some of these. You know, these are civilian spacecraft and geostationary environment, you can imagine, you know, any damage to any of the spacecraft is huge. And together, this, this, this asset is 200 billion in space assets. So if we can provide forecasting, then there is mitigation that can take place. We can't turn the sun off. We can't tell the sun, no, we don't want a storm. But we have to figure out how to mitigate, and that's why forecasting so important. It's, it's very much like terrestrial weather in that regard. Satellite industry, as I was mentioning, uh, you can see instruments and spacecraft can be turned off or put on safe mode. Uh, for maneuver planning, we need to know what's coming at us. Anomaly assessments, if something happens on a spacecraft, can we figure out what happened? And knowing what the sun was doing becomes very important. Uh, orbit determination and accuracy is a major storm. Sometimes that can change the atmospheric conditions and the orbit that you are in can significantly change. Uh, global positioning system, you know, we all use it today. Vehicle navigation system, railway control, hydro traffic management, emergency response, all of these can and are affected by space weather. Airlines and polar routes. More and more, we have lots of transpolar routes because it's a shorter distance to go over, you know, going from here to Hong Kong or China. These uh, polar routes are actually vulnerable to space weather simply because um, your communication, you know, FAA requires that you must have two modes of communication when you are uh, in, from any airline. And in the polar route, sometimes during an intense storm, you can have high frequency absorption and you can have one frequency down. 
and therefore airlines will often have to reroute flights from uh, polar routes. And this can be you know, significant uh, cost to the airlines, but they are absolutely tuned in to what's happening on the sun. Electric power will create, and I'll talk more about this, and this might probably be the most vulnerable um, aspect of space weather. Um, and, and that is, as I was indicating, you know, the ground currents that are generated from such a storm can actually affect transformers. And we have had several examples of that. Uh, in 1989, hydrocubic failure was cycling between 24 to 40 hours of total blackout in that area. Now that's one thing, you know, you deal with a power failure at that level, 20 hours, 40 hours, okay, you, you march back out of it, even though there is significant economy damage. But our power grids are vulnerable enough that these transformers under certain conditions can get completely fried. And we might not have any backup sources. These are uh, areas of intense investigation and risk mitigation right now. High energy particles, and uh, these are absolute hazards to human health, especially for astronauts doing extravehicular activities. Um, otherwise, we have crew passengers in high flying jets and polar rub depending on what altitude they are flying at, depending on what the severity of the storm is. And in fact, in new countries, you know, they, they keep track of dosage on their uh, airline crew. So th this, is, this is from the last solar cycle, in solar cycle 23. And this, this was a time frame in um, 2003 during Halloween, in October, we, we kind of dubbed it the Halloween storm. Over a two-week period, we had a significant number of one of the most intense solar storms that we have experienced in a while. And uh, what you are just seeing there is, at first, you saw the corona literally blowing up. And so this white cloud that you're seeing are essentially these puffballs of electric material, right? It's electrons and protons. That's what's traveling at a very high velocity, probably 800 kilometers per second. And so for your reference, this is kind of the sun. And uh, what you're looking at here is about 10, 15 solar radii. This material, uh, is flowing out and eventually will come in pinch of Earth's magnetosphere. And, and then there might or might not be a transfer of energy depending on the magnetic field of this particular event. Not every storm that is generated on the sun and directed at Earth will produce a geomagnetic storm. It depends on the orientation of the magnetic field. I want to point out this white um, out kind of noisy thing that you are seeing, what that is, is actually particles hitting the detector of our SOHO instrument. It, it's, in this case, it just becomes an in-situ device measuring the particles. It, it's just bombarded by it. SOHO happens to be outside of Earth's um, magnetosphere, you know, point in, in an area called L1, where the gravity between sun and moon balances it, it's in a halo orbit, and it's continuously observing the sun. So, you know, I was supposed to talk about um, space weather superstorm. What do we mean by extreme space weather or space weather superstorm? And so this is from a paper by two scientists, Kleiber and Spalger, published in 2004. So the data I'm going to present to you does not take into account some of the current activity that's going on in this cycle. It's a previous cycle. So the, how, how do we define extreme space weather? You know, is it the biggest geomagnetic storm? That occurred in March 1989 when we had the hydro Quebec failure. The biggest solar particle event occurred in September 1859. And that is known as the Carrington event. That is the largest event that we 
have record of today from whatever we can import, you know, data that we can import from. The lowest latitude auroras were observed in February 1872. So when a storm is really large, normally auroras are high latitude phenomena. But if the storm is really intense, you can see aurora down to Colorado, New Mexico, Florida, you're going down south. That means your magnetic field of the Earth has just opened up. It got so crunched down that the close fields are very close to the equator. Entire field otherwise has opened up, so the particles are penetrating. So that's another measure. The fastest coronal mass ejection on record crossed the sun Earth divide in only 14 hours in August 1972, and we were extremely lucky because in between two successive Apollo flights, our astronauts did not, there were no plans for such events. We didn't know enough. The most intense sun ionic, uh, ionospheric disturbance occurred during the Halloween storm, and this is where the ionosphere act changes, collapses. Or no, rather it gets re-energized because there's a lot of energy that's pumped into it. So I'm going to quickly go over some scales that NOAA, which is the official uh, sort of uh, uh, official organization that does the forecasting for space weather at NASA. We take observations, we do science, we pass on our knowledge, but NOAA has the responsibility for doing the forecasting to the general public and other organizations, and so I'm going to use some of their scales. So, solar flares, electromagnetic pulse from the sun, and um, what you're seeing there are some strong X-ray flares from 1976, you know, much like we do Earth weather, it's, it's kind of a strong, medium, mild, that's kind of the level. If you have kind of an extreme event, which is an X-ray flare, X20, sometimes it can even be higher than that uh, if it's an R5 uh, level. And the consequences are your uh, high frequency radio blackout on the Earth, uh, entire sunlit side of the Earth, and other you know, direct radio interference with GPS signals, accelerated orbital decay of satellites, etc. So this happens not too often, maybe once a solar cycle, but remember, we don't understand enough to say how often it can happen. It is simply statistical, this information. And these statistics are about you know, five solar cycles long because that's when we have had space and assets. Geomagnetic storms. Geomagnetic storms are when you have a G5 index, you know, which measures actually ground-based <coughs> magnetometer. This is uh, kind of a weaker signal, but again, you can see the highest was in March 14th, 1989, and it goes down. Now, this is not a very good discriminator because you can this index gets saturated easily, so you can get many false alarms in this case. Solar energetic particles. So I already talked to you about the solar energetic particles, mostly protons. During the Carrington event, 1859, that solar energetic particle humans was a factor of two higher than any other we have observed. So that it kind of stands out. We haven't seen anything quite like that. And then so if you look at the S index of NOAA, which actually gives solar energy particle um, numbers, you know, you can see again this index is pretty good. You you get a solar energetic strong solar energetic particle event maybe once a solar cycle. So that this is these are our statistics. Okay, and so when you have a condition like this again it's radiation hazard to astronauts, etc. etc. Satellite damage. So as I mentioned, NOAA is five and R5 levels are uh, pretty rare and these are good indication of extreme events of space, but not the geomagnetic storms which is where we actually feel the impact, which is, which is where, you know, if we knew that there was a strong geomagnetic index and it's correct, then you can actually ask your power grid operators, perhaps, to turn off their transformers because it's otherwise might uh, damage 
the transformers. But we are, we are not too good yet, you know, providing that level of discrimination that we can with S5 and R5. So what was special about the Carrington event? Is that our example of a super storm? Now remember, that's the only thing we have with our data today. We don't know what we had before. One thing that was really interesting with the Carrington event is all the three indices that I showed to you, all three of them were high, extremely high which has not been the case with any of the other storms that we have witnessed so far. And so during that event, 1859, there were three days of intense aurora below 50 degrees latitude. In fact, as far south as 10 degrees latitude, that's, that's quite intense. Significant portions of the world's telegraph lines were adversely affected. Now remember, telegraph in those era is sort of the modern, you know, uh, equivalent of internet today. Uh, they, they caught on fire, stations caught on fire, uh, all kinds of things happened. The largest solar particle event on record, even when we do ice core data, which has a way of capturing some of this information. When these particles come, impinge on our atmosphere, they produce a lot of oxides, nitrogen oxides. These then get embedded in ice core, and you can do ice core sample analysis and get some estimate of, you know, how um, uh, you know, have we had any storms of this level? At least so far, our, our uh, indication is we haven't seen anything. An estimated impact is huge. If a Carrington-like event happened today and we did not turn our transformers off, then that would result in large-scale blackouts affecting more than 130 million people and would expose more than 350 million transformers to the risk of permanent damage. And the reason that this is not a good situation because these transformers are one of a kind design that takes months to build and would take months to replace. So unless we are prepared, we are not going to be able to replace them. And so this is, you know, your electric power is the backbone of the nation's critical infrastructure. So you can imagine, once your transformers go, once you have no power, every other sector that supports us in, in, a, in a modern society is going to be affected. We become very vulnerable. And so, you know, we need to do something about it. Uh, people are interested in space weather, uh, and uh, scientists are, uh, engineers are, we are not stupid. We understand the economic impact, and, and space weather is actually gaining in reputation because people have not thought about it enough, that we need to not only monitor the sun, understand the sun, provide the forecasting, but also make people knowledgeable. Because we can do all of this, but if people will not take mitigating actions, they're back to square one. And so, you know, we, we actually are not defenseless. You know, it, it's, we are not at the mercy of sun. Yes, sun can do whatever it is doing and will do, but we can protect ourselves if we uh, have the knowledge and we equip, equip ourselves adequately. So we have a National Space Weather Program in place where many of the agencies like NASA, NOAA, NSF, DOE, DOD come together to share resources, share science, operations, etc. And that, that, that's very helpful because it's, it, you know, space weather is something that I don't think, forget about one agency, it's not even a problem of one nation, it's a global problem. So we are beginning to work together to address this. Um, as I mentioned, NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center, located in Boulder, they are providing watches, warning alerts, not only for customers in the U.S., but for the entire world. And, and they're doing this 
utilizing science observations, sometimes science models, whatever is available. And then at NASA, we have what is called a heliophysics systems observation. And what you see here are about 18 spacecraft that is doing surveillance of the sun, the interplanetary medium, and also inside of geospace, uh, literally to provide the science backbone, the science understanding, and also observations that is necessary to do the forecasting for NOAA. Just a quick, you know, thought chart that the, the, what I have put down here are some of the assets that exist today from NASA and NOAA and USGS. But unless we make plans for future, you know, some of these will go away, much like it's happening to our terrestrial weather forecasting. So we really need to be cognizant of this. Well, now let me tell you a little bit about what we do not know about. I mean, there are things we do know and can predict, but then there are items that we can't say very much about. So I want to now talk to you about the, our understanding of the solar cycle. Just when we thought it was safe to predict the solar cycle, that's kind of the impression we give when we say no one can do the prediction. So this is a solar cycle, solar cycle 24, and what you're seeing there is that this solar cycle is actually significantly bigger than the previous solar cycle. Not only that, this solar cycle is actually weaker than the past solar cycle. And then in some way, and, and, and scientists have tried to, of course, you know, uh, predict this. I want to give you an analogy here. So if we are used to terrestrial weather forecasting, you know, but, but if we have trouble predicting the timing and intensity, say, of winter storms. Now think about it this way. NOAA forecasters told us, you know, that you have a 40% chance that the winter will begin in December this year. And then there is a 20% chance that it will last for at least three months. You're taking away kind of the common notional knowledge we have about season and what happens. And, and that's where we are with solar cycle forecasting. We really cannot say the severity, intensity, and the time of when this solar cycle will occur. So that, that's, we, we are at least 50 years behind terrestrial weather in our understanding and forecasting of what the sun is doing. But the sun is never boring. That's one thing for sure, you know. In fact, instead of looking the chart I showed to you earlier, we just showed solar peak going kind of horizontally. What I did here is I kind of turned the solar cycle sideways. And if you turn the solar cycle sideways, then you forget about minimum and maximum. But you look at two extreme points on the sun, okay, it's a behavior of this particular stellar body, and each one of these points, you know, whether it is solar, uh, solar mass or solar mean in this case, has significant impact on our environment, significant impact. So it's always causing solar, uh, causing space weather of a different sort. So I think the time has come not to just look at solar max only, but to really understand the sun and understand it at all phases. And so I'll, I'll show you some. This is this is kind of uh, interesting. Uh, you know that you have become popular when CNN picks you up. This is a fireball you brought to today on the left side of the sun. NASA refers to I know NASA refers to it as a giant prominent. That was accompanied by a solar flare. NASA says the eruption can be pleased to know, not aimed at Earth. That's crazy. Isn't that not the coolest thing you've seen today? I don't know, it's yeah, not. It's probably the coolest thing. I know you don't see a lot of cool things, but that is a tricky cool thing. That is really amazing. And it was just the, the image. Like, did they just happen to be, I mean, are they rolling with that all the time? Did they know it was going to happen? I'll have to ask my people to check that. <laughs> <Yeah>. But <laughs> that is plasma you see there. And, uh, yeah. Uh, magnetic plasma? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so, uh, so this is kind of, I have to share this, it's kind of hilarious. You know, one day I'm watching CNN and this just shows up. So people are, everybody is paying attention. This I show just to bring the point home that NASA is not only looking at the sun from sun earth line, but actually also away from sun earth line. So we are able to see the sun 360 degrees. And with two of our spacecraft, stereo A and B, one of the spacecraft absorbed a solar storm that was so powerful, something we haven't seen. And this was just last year. Fortunately, it was not directed at Earth. And so scientists are trying to speculate now if that storm was indeed headed in the Earth direction what would have happened. So things are, even though it is a weak solar cycle, you can see the sun is capable of producing very strong um, storms. Very quickly, you know, space weather is not something we experience just at all. Space weather is interplanetary. What sun puts out essentially travels through the solar system. So anything in the solar system Moon, asteroid, planets all experience this and they respond differently depending on the atmosphere that they carry. And what you're seeing there are some of our models that are actually doing this solar system wide prediction. Very recently, you know, Curiosity was shut down on Mars and that was because of a solar storm. And so we are able to provide, sometimes, you know, you can't do anything to stop it from happening, but it's anomaly resolution, you're able to tell. This is what happened. And so this development is almost like you know, the four satellite images of hurricanes on Earth, in, in some ways, again, going back to the terrestrial <coughs> weather. Uh, sun's impact on other planets. You can see Jupiter, uh, Aurora, image with Hubble Space Telescope, this aurora at Saturn's poles. These are very strong magnetosphere. Um, and you know, there are similar physical processes evident in vastly different environments. And that's why we scientists love to study this field. You know, we can take our physics and we can apply it in different environments. And talking about scientists. Another huge star making headlines this week. And this one is actually a huge star. It's the sun! which in less than 48 hours has emitted two massive bursts of electrified gas at the Earth. The first of these disruptive solar flares took place Wednesday, buffeting our planet's magnetosphere. Why, God? Why must you let bad things buffet good magnetospheres? Oh, magnetosphere! The flare caused a series of geomagnetic storms across our atmosphere, leading to disruptions in radio signals, airplane communications, and satellite operations. Oh, and there was also this. It almost appeared to be standing outside in Montana. That was amazing. What a beautiful scene he was standing outside in front of. Road scientist, plasma physicist Bruce Suetani spoke about the size of the flares. When the uh, flares and the cold mass ejections come out from the sun... You know what? Can, can uh, we, I'm sorry, they, doctor. You're a plasma physicist. This is the only time anyone's going to talk to you. You understand? This is your chance. Show some enthusiasm. Get up your A-game. So uh, NASA has... Uh, uh, with the cameras. You know what? Can we just play? I'm sorry. I expect that kind of lackadaisical bull <laughs> from a flatalist or an entomologist, but not <laughs> from a plasma physicist. I'm sorry, I can't. So you see what we have to suffer? <laughs> So, as I, as I mentioned, we, we have stereo, SDO, we are actually able to see 360 degree view of the sun. We have cool apps on iPhone, iPad, 3D sun, it's free, where you can actually literally, so we are downlinking data real time 
So you can get what the sun is doing on the palm of your hand instantaneously. And so you should try it out. There is 3D sun and there is I3D sun, which is interplanetary 3D sun. The budget cuts are obviously hitting hard. The rubber chicken in a lunchbox is NASA's latest high-tech move to measure solar radiation. Although actually, there is some science behind this bizarre flight. School kids from California launched Camilla, the mascot for NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, in early March, during powerful solar storms which battered satellites and lit up the northern lights. Camilla was carrying radiation-sensing badges, once as the storm began on March 3rd and right at its strongest on March 10th. The plucky chicken was carried aloft on a helium weather balloon, soaring to 40 kilometers before it popped and she parachuted back to Earth. She may look a little silly, but this truly is one step of foul. And th these, were, these are high school kids essentially doing their own science experiment using, you know, our mascot. But the good thing is that kids are actually interested and the world is getting around. Um, th these are all measures of different kinds of outreach activity we do. I have helped produce two shows actually, Journey to the Stars, which is still running at Air and Space Museum, Einstein Planetary and Cosmic Collisions. And then we shared this with students um, all over the country and the world. We also provide educational material to go with this. And finally, I think I'll play this and then wait for it to end and wait for your question. So this is this is kind of a little piece from Cosmic Collision um, Planetarium show. And this was produced by American Museum of Natural History in New York in, in words of Robert Redford, who will recap to you basically in his beautiful voice everything that I just said is a star, like the other stars we see in the night sky. It's much closer though, so it looks different, like a gently glowing ball. But there's nothing gentle about the sun. Those dark patches are sunspots. Each of them is about the size of Earth. Sunspots look dark because they're the coolest places on the sun, only about 8,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the rest of the sun is even hotter. The sun's energy, like that of all stars, is created by collisions between tiny particles called protons. Every second, countless numbers of protons collide and fuse within the sun's core, releasing incomprehensible amounts of energy. Most of this energy leaves the sun as light. Some of it leaves the sun's surface in a continuous stream of charged particles known as the solar wind which blows out into the solar system at almost a million miles an hour. Or in less frequent, but faster solar storms that blast particles out into space. We're looking at actual images of solar storms taken by a NASA satellite. See that static? That's a solar storm cloud hitting the satellite and overwhelming its imaging device. blasts across the planets in the solar system every second of every day. It's so powerful that contact with it would sweep away a large portion of our upper atmosphere, removing much of our water and dramatically altering the development of life on Earth. But fortunately, Earth is protected by an invisible natural shield. What you're seeing is a visualization Earth's magnetic field. This field arises from Earth's iron core, which makes our planet act like a big magnet, attracting some things and repelling others. Wrapped in this cocoon, Earth is sheltered from the solar wind. But some of the particles make it through this magnetic barrier, eventually reaching the North and South Pole. The results are spectacular. Glorious, shimmering curtains of color. This one, is the aurora borealis, the northern lights. Auroras occur when charged particles from the solar wind and solar storms collide with the upper atmosphere of Earth, causing atmospheric gases to glow. 
That's the International Space Station, circling the globe in low Earth orbit, about 250 miles up. Not many people have seen the aurora from out in space. The collisions that cause auroras happen between 60 and 300 miles above the surface of the Earth. Far above where airplanes fly. And create one of the greatest natural light shows on our planet. reminded us that there are spacecraft monitoring the solar weather. Is the solar weather also dangerous for those spacecraft? Uh, it is. It is. And um, what you saw, some of those imaging devices that get bombarded by these particles, uh, sometimes some of these um, sensors will fail. So you can't, you have to have you know, we are, NASA uh, observatories are there for a few years at a time gathering science data. But if you wanted to have this solar uh, observing system for monitoring, for operational need, then you have to have a constant supply of them. Because they will eventually wear out. So we have to send more to replace them? Yes. Thank you. What's the typical warning time that we get? Typical warning, so you can see a storm brewing on the sun. If something happens on the sun, depends on what velocity it's traveling with. Typically between 400 to 1,000 kilometers per second. That will take anywhere between four to, you know, two days to come to work. Uh, but any storm that happens, as I indicated, not every storm that happens will actually cause geomagnetic activity. So the real warning comes actually with one of our satellites called ACE, which is at L1, about 1.6 million miles from, um, from Earth. Once ACE actually measures the particles, that's where it's able to determine the magnetic field orientation of this plasma. Because it's the magnetic field that determines whether there will be connection with our own magnetic field or whether it's going to be reflected, essentially. And that timing is of the order of half hour to 90 minutes. Yes. Um, in 1959, Richard Carrington, who was 23 years old, an amateur astronomer, and I'm just wondering, you know, I think his method was sketching. And I'm wondering yes. how the sketches of the 23-year-old amateur astronomer were turned into the uh, metrics that were used and, and how accurate do you think those metrics are? I, I think we, we know, I mean, he, 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 it's phenomenal what he was able to see. So what he saw was a solar flare, again, almost like naked eye, of course, he was not looking, but this sudden white flash. We have given all of these words now new terminology, of course. Um, so I, I think we are beyond where he was in understanding how solar flares happen. What is interesting is the, the intensity of this flare and what it caused in terms of uh, you know, data that we have from ground magnetometer. In fact, there was only one ground-based magnetometer that had data, data which was from Kulaba in Mumbai. And it, it's, it's, you know, even that was saturated. So we really don't know the severity that it caused, other than, of course, the collateral uh, description 
uh, fire in telegraph wires or uh, you know, people in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park waking up and cooking breakfast in the light of Corona. It was so bright. So these are kind of anecdotal evidences of how powerful a storm that was. But he, he was uh, spectacularly um, accurate in the way he diagnosed the, 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 and, and, and his sketches of the flare. Pretty amazing. Um, how do we protect our electric grid? It looks like uh, if we get hit by the maximum um, solar um, storm, you know, we're back in the Stone Age because it destroys our entire electric grid around the world. Uh, you say it, I didn't. <laughs> it's unbeatable. Um, um, that, that is true. Our electric grids are very vulnerable, but you have to think of it kind of two ways. Power grids are vulnerable to electromagnetic pulse. So any pulse that is created, whether natural or unnatural, can cause the same problem. And that's why our grid, uh, FEMA, they are all very aware of this situation and the vulnerability and looking at mitigating steps. As I was indicating, if we can give them good information, good forecasting, uh, our grid operators absolutely can take mitigating steps. But for an our grid operator to turn off the power, has consequential damages. So th this, is, this is not something that we scientists are going to be solving. It requires legislation. You, know, you turn up our grid, you have turned up a hospital unit, and any other number of things that you can imagine. So there has to be significant dialogue to figure out if you know, what are the mitigating steps and how can that be legislated so that the power grids will have the ability to turn our grids off. So we haven't done that. Just um, just, uh, uh, nobody has shared the complete story with me. Maybe it's going on. But, but I know that our president is actually very worried about this. And so there is a lot of attention and thought into it. It's a little bit more than just uh, turning off the power grid or not turning off the power grid. There's Linkages in between power stations yes. and you know, consumers and and uh, producers of, of electricity and in one of these large uh, storms, if they break those linkages, uh, produce the, the power more locally, that uh, minimizes the risk. But people are still getting electricity. Yes, um, the, the, you know we have only concentrated on the extreme uh, space weather. What we don't know are that the conditions in any given circumstance, imagine a summer um, evening where everybody is utilizing power at its max. The conditions can be such that even a small fluctuation can trip the transformer. So that, that, the, the, these are things that are being looked at but not to be understood. What's, uh, what's NASA doing sort of within its lane to keep a continuing stream of observations. And in particular, is NASA considering continuing to launch the same design at less cost instead of coming up with new designs every time? The answer to the second one is no. So NASA, what we are doing is really advancing science. Fortunately for us and the nation, we love the sun and still trying to understand it. So we do launch many different kinds of observatory and they are always different. Once we have actually launched an observatory, understood the sign, we go do something else. NOAA does the operational spacecraft. NOAA has often taken uh, NASA science observations from before and made that into an operational spacecraft. For example, the GOES spacecraft is an operational spacecraft. It has uh, an instrument that is designed essentially on based on one of our predecessor instruments. NOAA is planning to launch something like ACE, which will again be utilizing some of the observations that has already been prototyped. Okay, thank you.